My name is Stephanie, and I'm so glad you decided to join us on YouTube today. We have an exciting message for you today, so make sure that you're engaged, leaned in, and taking notes. Also, be sure to like and share this video. And if you haven't yet, be sure to turn on notifications and subscribe so you can stay up to date with everything happening on our YouTube channel. Now let's jump into the sermon. We are in for a real treat. We have in the house this evening Dr. Ronnie Floyd. And I thought about all the things because when you go on his website and you pull off the page and everything that is written about Dr. Floyd, I would literally be here the entire night. And I thought about a lot of things I could say. He's president, was president, former president, of Southern Baptist Convention. He's been president of National Day of Prayer. Uh, he's been interviewed on Fox News, New York Times. He's written over 24 books. Uh, you got to be a little smart to write 24 books. And uh, there's a lot of great things that I could say about Dr. Floyd. I could talk about his iconic leadership in Northwest Arkansas and around this world. But there's a couple of things I really want to hone in on. Number one, I believe this. I've shared this with him before. I truly believe that God raises up men and women in every decade, every century, every season of life to be a voice. And I believe that Dr. Ronnie, Dr. Ronnie Floyd, God has gifted him and anointed him to be a voice on behalf of our country. And I truly believe that God's blessed him with that anointing to declare that we need revival and that we need a great awakening in America. And so here's what I would say. A lot of people may know of Dr. Ronnie Floyd, but I've been blessed to know him. He has been a friend to me since I have arrived in Northwest Arkansas. He's been a true friend to me. As busy as this guy is, I tell people this often, you text Dr. Ronnie Floyd, he returns your text real quickly. He's just been a great friend to me. He's been a great prayer partner for me and a great support for me. So I can honestly say I am so honored tonight to have my friend at Northwest Church, Dr. Ronnie Floyd. Come on. Would you welcome him tonight? <laughs> We're going to do great. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Y'all are amazing. Usually Baptists just stand up when they're leaving. <laughs> and so thank God for all of you being here tonight. And I really commend you for the privilege of being in the house of God tonight. We welcome the Springdale campus. We welcome the Farmington campus and all of us here in the great city of Bentonville. What a pleasure. Thank you, Joe. I love Joe Lyons. Every Sunday morning, Joe prays for me. And I can't tell you what that means when I see his text, when I hear an encouraging word, and I just uh, love him and thank God for him and have watched this church flourish. You know what it's like to be a part of a flourishing church, a prosperous church, a fruitful church? That's what you're a part of. There's a lot of dead churches out here. You can go when you want, and you can park where you want. <laughs> it's great to be a part of a church that you don't, you got to worry about all that. You got to navigate that. You have to figure that out. And so I just want to praise the Lord and thank you so much for letting me come tonight. I want to begin this four weeks. And I want to preach specifically on this topic, where revival begins. Where revival begins. Now, life is full of defining moments. But what is a defining moment? A defining moment occurs when your life shifts in the present dramatically. And it shapes your future greatly. It's when something so happens in the present, your life shifts dramatically. You have no choice. 
and it shapes your future greatly. It is my prayer tonight that tonight will be a defining moment in your life. I can't make it that. You can't make it that. God can make it that. You know, when I gave my life to Christ, I had a defining moment. My life shifted in the present dramatically, and obviously, I still have a long hayover, hangover after getting saved, because it has totally, radically changed my future. I hope there are people here tonight or watching online tonight, wherever you may be, or one of the other campuses, that if you do not know where you're going when you die, that tonight will be the night like my night was many years ago when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me tell you something. You need to know you're going to heaven when you die. Amen. Because if you don't know that, you can know it. And you can know it tonight. When God called me to preach, it was another defining moment. I wanted to be a football coach. I still want to be a football coach. I would have been a pretty good football coach. But I want to tell you, my life changed. Went to college. I met this little girl named Gina. And wow, did my life change. All these years since she asked me to marry her, <laughs> our lives have changed dramatically. When we had children, two boys, oh, wow. Now today we wake up with seven grandchildren. I told them if they have any more, we're going to have to name tag them. <laughs> but our lives have shifted dramatically. You see, some of us could talk for hours here today about defining moments. And many of those defining moments are not funny moments. They're terrible moments. Awful moments. Loss of a job. Loss of a family member. Loss of a child. Loss of a mom or a dad or a spouse. Your life is never the same again. You walk with a limp until you go to heaven. And every time you limp, it reminds you that God is with you. God is with you. Oh, I'll never forget one of those defining moments. I was a young preacher, freshman in college. I was asked to go out at this Bible conference with this big-time preacher and at the end of that meeting that night, he and I and another young preacher like me, my last question to him was, if you could tell me anything I could do to my life to be great for God, would you tell me? He looked over those old eyebrows that needed to be cut. In his accent, he said, Ronnie, if you will learn how to give the first hour of your day to God, there is no telling what in the world God will do with you. Amen. I was young and I was dumb. Didn't know better. But ever since that day, I've taken that challenge. You see, when you think about defining moments... No one understands them greater than Jesus. Jesus is one big, historic, defining moment. But when you look at why we are here tonight, wouldn't it be amazing if God, over the course of these weeks, would give us a defining moment? But revival is not an event. Revival is not something that happens out there. 
Revival is the renewal of life or the waking up spiritually. That's what the word means. It means to revive. You can't revive that which has not been vibed. You've got to wake up. The Holy Spirit wakes up. He renews. And there is a difference between revival and between spiritual awakening. That's what revival is. But spiritual awakening occurs when great numbers of people who are far from God began to get saved. They come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. America needs a great awakening. The great awakenings of the 17 and 1800s have still shaped this country today. But what about the next 200 years? We cannot be shaped by atheism and secularism. And all the isms of the world, we need to be shaped by a God who could do more in a moment than you could ever do in a lifetime. We need a spiritual awakening. Listen now, revival precedes spiritual awakening. And it's the church that needs to be revived. America needs a spiritual awakening. And you know what precedes revival? Repentance. Repentance leads to revival, and revival leads to awakening. When I think of spiritual revival, no one embodies spiritual revival and awakening like Jesus Christ. And when you seriously evaluate his life, What was the secret? Well, you say, well, he was the son of God. Yes, he was, but he was also the son of man. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. You say, I don't understand that. Don't worry about it. (laughs) That's why you're not God. But the point is this. No one embodied revival and awakening more than Jesus. And my question is, Why? Why? Where revival begins. That's what I'm going to talk about. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to open it to the book of Mark. The second book in the New Testament. And I want to point our attention tonight to one verse. If you take notes, I'm going to give you several things along the way. But in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it tells us where revival begins. The Bible says these words, And in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and prayed there for a time. Powerful verse. You need to circle it. You need to highlight it if you have an e-device. You need to ponder it. But this is where revival begins. You see, before... Jesus ever saw the daylight. He prioritized fellowship with the Father. Jesus disciplined himself. Remember, he was human. He disciplined himself to rise early and to be with the Father. And when he got up, he rose to go to a private place. And in that private place, the scripture says that he prayed. He had fellowship with the Father. 
and he pleaded with the father about the lives of the people of the day and the purpose whereby he had come. It is so critical tonight that we never forget that there is an undeniable reality. We cannot walk away from this reality, and here it is. The priority of Jesus' life was his relationship with the Father in heaven. That was the priority. That was the priority. I mean, he prioritized that, and he rose to the occasion as the Son of God. Let me ask you tonight, what is your priority? What matters most to you? What relationship is the most important relationship in your life tonight? How is your relationship with God going? I mean, a simple question, this is a little challenging to answer but I had to ask it, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you because you need to see it. And I hope it convicts the socks off of you if you have any on. If Jesus, the Son of God, needs to rise early in the morning, even before the dawning of the day, to pray, shouldn't you at least, at least, Whatever time it may be. I mean, I realize some of you don't wake up till 10. <laughs> even if you go to work at 6. <laughs> Shouldn't you not at least consider beginning your day with God every day? This is where revival begins. Are you listening to me tonight? I'm preaching on where revival begins. Listen to me and never forget it. Revival begins in you. In you. It's not an event. It's an experience where God meets you at the point of your greatest need and rattles your life and defining moment after defining moment after defining moment happens. A moment that only God can create. I'm reminded of David in chapter 5 of the book of Psalm. He writes in verse 3, In the morning, Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I present my prayer to you and be on the watch. Now, in Psalm 5, David was surrounded by many people who opposed him. But with urgency, he prayed for protection. And he expected God to intervene. And do you realize that throughout the vast majority of David's life, David was a man who was committed to a deep prayer life. And oh, I've got to show you something else. I mean, a thought came to me. I mean, you've got to see it tonight. And I got it for you because I want you to really take it in your heart. It's worth, it's worth even taking a picture of tonight. It's that good. Listen carefully. God did not raise David to lead and influence his generation because of his talent, intellect, or passion. He chose to raise David because he was a man after God's own heart. You see, some of you think you're going to make it because you're talented. Good luck. And some of you think you're going to make it because you're intellectual. And thank God for intellectual people. And some of you think you're going to make it because you're passionate. Oh, no, God, God looks on your heart. He, he wipes away all that clutter on social medias of your life. 
just kind of pushes flush. And let me show you where you are. And he looks at your heart. Each of us should be Christ followers who are committed to the will of God and the ways of God. And I want to say it this way, whatever the cost, you need to be committed. And there will be a cost and a price to pay. When you look at Psalm 5.3, if I were doing it exegetically, I would tell you, you talk about this, this verse teaches you to have a conviction about prayer. It talks to you and calls you to the practice of prayer. It, it anticipates when he, when he prays, he anticipated for God to answer and to move in his life. I want to ask you tonight, do you anticipate God to answer you when you pray? Or you go, oh, I can't believe he heard that. <laughs> Golly. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you're looking. That's what the watchman does. The watchman, he's watching. Are you watching? Watching. Watching for God to answer. Hey, hey, fellowship, let me tell you something, Northwest Church. Are you watching for revival? If you're not watching for revival, it means you're not praying for revival. You're not seeking revival. You got to be watching. What if what if revival came tonight? It's mess your night up, I can assure you. And what if revival came Sunday morning? What if revival came on your way to work tomorrow? As an answer to your prayer tonight. Do you know why David looked? I'll tell you why. Don't forget this little phrase. Because prayer is faith. Prayer is faith. Anytime I pray, I am placing faith in God. There may be times I need to pray for more faith, but that's not the point. The point is, prayer is faith. Even if you don't know how to pray, don't worry about it. Anytime you exercise, bow your head, get on your knees, whatever you want to do. Listen, anytime you express prayer, listen to me. When you pray, you depend on God. And when you don't pray, you're depending on yourself. Take your choice. They both have products, one good and one not. You see, the biblical observation from David's life is that the priority of David's life was his relationship with God daily. Yes, David did struggle with life. He had a miscue or many of them along the way, just like all of us sin. He had a very large miscue that's recorded in the scripture. But isn't it amazing that when he experienced grace, of all the people, God's word says he's a man after God's own heart. You can't out sin. God's grace. The most important decision you ever make in your life is walking with Jesus Christ daily. And many of you who are Christ followers and you've been saved, some of you for perhaps a few decades or for a while, you need to make sure that you are committed to walking with Jesus Christ daily. You know why? Because it defines you in your life. It shifts your life and perspective dramatically. In this crazy, wild, nutcase world, listen to me tonight. You need to be able to see it through the eyes of God, not through the eyes of men. It shapes your life personally. It shapes your future personally. It shapes your family. It shapes your future. It, it shapes you. It shapes, 
Listen to me, church. It can even shape your whole church. It's just one of you. Just one of you would get on fire more than you're on fire today. If just one, no telling what could happen. Just one. A couple of realities I don't want you to forget tonight. As your spiritual life goes, so goes the rest of your life. Some of you want a better life, better, better family, better kids, better this, better that, better mom and dad, better whatever. Okay, well, I'll tell you the key to that. Develop your prayer life. Develop your spiritual life. And then another reality is as your spiritual life goes, so goes the spiritual life for your church. When you have a problem with your church, hey, look at the problem in the mirror. You are the church. Church in the building. Buildings come and go. Buildings can burn down tomorrow, but the church is still alive. And your church needs you to be on fire with God. The greatest need in your church today are thousands of you, hundreds of you, who will walk with Jesus Christ. Because I'll tell you what, now listen, this is where revival begins. So tonight at my short time left with you, I need you to really dial in. Because I'm going to challenge you with five challenges before we leave. And you got to really listen. And if you can remember them, or you can just write them down, I want to tell you tonight the structure of how to experience revival. They're going to be men coming in here over the next three weeks, and they're going to be telling you this, telling you that, and that's great. And they should. That's why they're here. That's why I came. But if you don't build a structure under everything they tell you, it goes out. The fire goes out. So, I want to give you the structure since I'm preacher number one. Okay? And if they want to stoke the fire, let them stoke to the glory of God. But there are five personal decisions, personal decisions that will lead you to experience revival. Decision number one. I would develop my spiritual life daily. Just making that commitment. Some of you develop your career, your family, your baseball skills, football skills, cheerleading skills. Some of you develop your skills financially, your job, your career, how I can be a better leader. And I want you to do all those things, all of them. Go do them. We'll do them. But take more serious than any of them. I am going to develop my spiritual life. Amen. And you cannot delegate your spiritual life to somebody else. Nobody can walk with God for you. You walk with God. You develop your own life spiritually. So arise and determine. Okay? Decision number one. I want revival. Okay, good. Then you got to start here. I will develop my spiritual life. Anybody buying in? Decision number two, I will release my life to God daily. Every day, I'm going to release my life to God. It's not my life. I'm bought with a price. Therefore, I must glorify God with everything that I am, the Bible says. So I've got to surrender my life to God every day. Some of you have children, really small children, 
like even babies, children that just start walking perhaps. There's nothing, there's nothing like a little child coming up to an adult and extending their hands. What are you going to do? Put your hands down. No, what are you going to do? You're going to pick them up. You're going to grab them. That's what you do when you surrender your life. You surrender your life to God. God, I give you my life. I wonder how many of you tonight came to church and never asked God to fill you with the Holy Spirit before you came. How many of you drove? Yeah, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you drove away to work this morning? You never even asked God to fill you with his spirit. Lord, I give you my mind, my emotion, my body, my spirit. Everything that I am, everything that I will ever be, I surrender to you completely. Would you fill me? Fill me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet to the width of my hands. Would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? I don't want to be filled with some outside substance like wine because that leads me to live an excessive life and a reckless life. I don't want to be filled with myself because that will lead to debauchery and evil thinking. No, Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit and I stand on your word in Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with the other, but you be filled with the Holy Spirit. You surrender your life humbly before the Lord. Are you going to buy him? That's got to happen every day, at least once a day. You say, well, and once enough? Probably not. <laughs> because you're going to have leaks. <laughs> Could be by the time you get to work, I have these crazy people driving. <laughs> Decision number three, I will read my Bible daily. How are you going to be? How are you going to have a revival if you don't read your Bible? Come on, folks. We need a revival of the Bible. God speaks to us from the Bible. This is God's word. I want to be open to whatever the Lord wants to say to me, but whatever he says to me, I have to filter it through his word. This is the priority. This is God's holy word. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I want to challenge all of you. Just start reading your Bible daily. And I, I want to, there's a group here who need to grow more than that. I want to encourage you to start reading your Bible through annually. All you got to do is read about four to five chapters a day. I mean, that's about 15 minutes of you on social media finding out some crazy knucklehead thing somebody your friend does. <laughs> and that's going to go away. None of it matters. Most of it's exaggerated, and I'll leave it there. I just want to say it really clear because the worst thing in the world is for a person to say they want the Lord to use them and they don't even read their Bible. Amen. Consider reading the Bible. You cannot be all God wants you to be if you don't read your Bible. It's impossible. Nothing has shaped my life more than reading through the Bible on an annual basis. I've done it for over 32 years. I've already done it once this year. I'm three-fourths through the New Testament a second time. Pour the Word of God into your life. Uh, listen, uh, I'm going to listen to a little news every now and then. I'm kind of a news hound a little bit. I can see all this stuff out here, but I'm telling you, I gotta, it's got to go through the Word of the living God. Decision number four, I will talk to God daily. That's better than some of you do with your spouse. I will talk to God daily. 
prayer is a conversation with God. That's what it is. Don't make prayer hard. And prayer is listening to God and God talking to you. How does God talk to you? I'll tell you how he talks to you. Through this book. That's how he talks to you. Okay? Well, I saw one time, I saw this. Okay, fine. Maybe you did. Does it go through the scripture? If it does, it's good. If it's not, sorry, you just ate bad the night before. <laughs> but listen carefully. You've got to understand, I'm, I'm going to talk to God every day. Some of you need this tonight. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. How many of you are worried about something tonight? But in everything, by prayer and pleading, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God says, I want to hear from you. Make your request known. Well, I don't want to bother God. Dude, he is God. He and you. You're nothing compared to God. Pray specifically. Organize your prayer life. I could do an hour teaching you how to organize your prayer life. Many people don't pray because they're not organized to pray. If you'll look on your phones or on your iPads, I, I, I keep a running prayer list. And I do it on my notes app of the iPad. That way you can easily de delete and you can easily add. You can keep and track what God's doing. And you pray on the power of the Word of God. You have a decision to make. You get a word from God in His Word. And then you stand on that Word. And you plead with God and watch for Him to answer. I will talk to God daily. We got any takers on that? And he takes her on reading the Bible daily. Oh, listen, it's all about, remember, that's that structure, structure. Because one day the fire's going to fall here and the wind's going to blow and it's going to be good. And all of a sudden you go, well, what happened to that? I'll tell you what happened to it. You didn't have anything built on it. You got to deepen your life. It's time to grow up for some of us. And decision number five, boy, you need to hear this. I will prioritize Jesus and his kingdom daily. Boy, that's a, that's, a, that's a big old gulp right there now. I will prioritize Jesus and his kingdom daily. That's in my decision making, in the way I treat people, the way I act, my conduct, my lifestyle. I'm going to prioritize Jesus. What does Jesus want me to do? It's Jesus first in my life. I love sports, but sports are not first. I love my wife, but Gina's not first, and she knows it. It's Jesus, not Gina. I love preaching. I love ministry. I love reaching the world. I'm, I'm, a, I'm crazy about leadership. But I want to tell you something. It's Jesus first and his kingdom. His kingdom. Jesus said it this way, but seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided to you. Listen to me tonight, Northwest Church. We need kingdom power. We need kingdom living. We need kingdom walking. And it's time to prioritize Jesus in our lives and his kingdom daily. His kingdom. And I want to just tell you, I've lived here a long time. Just moved back about five weeks ago. I pastored a little church down the road, 32 years and seven months, called Cross Church. But you listen carefully. Northwest Arkansas needs a church like yours that is totally sold out after the heart of God. Committed to reaching people for Jesus, touching all generations, all ethnicities, strong Bible preaching, exciting worship, 
passionate prayer because we need an unceasing prayer movement if we're going to see a mighty movement of revival. Revival begins with you. Teenagers, revival begins with you. You can't wait on mom or dad or some hero you got out here. Revival begins with you. And some of you who are 75, it begins with you. Well, my day's come. No, your day hadn't come or you'd already be in heaven if you're going to heaven. (laughs) If you're not going there, you don't want your day to come. Leave a legacy. Have a revival. Burn with a passion for revival. Let tonight be a defining moment. Let the Holy Spirit define a moment tomorrow morning before you ever leave the house. Or the first thing you do when you go to work, have a defining moment with God. There are people who are listening tonight and watching. You need a defining moment of personal salvation when you open your heart to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you tonight, if you've never met him, you don't know him, you, if you were to die today, you'd spend eternity in a place called hell because you've never had forgiveness of sins. Many of us were right where you are. But we were saved by grace. He took away our sin when we did not deserve it. You say, well, I'm not sure I'm saved, Pastor Ronnie. I'm not sure I'm saved. Hey, can you tell me about the day, the time, the moment? Can you share that with me? Well, I'm I'm not not sure. I don't know. Oh, I don't remember the day or the hour. You don't have to remember the day or the hour. I tell people everywhere, you don't have to remember the day or the hour. But I'll tell you one thing you will never, ever forget. You will never forget the place you gave your life to Jesus Christ. If you can't remember the place you gave your life to Christ, you need to make this your place tonight and give your life to Christ. I plead with you in a moment. When we worship for a moment, I'm going to ask you to leave your chair. Come, because we want to rejoice and see you come to Christ. Or better yet, if you want to give your life to Christ, in a moment I want to urge you, when I bow my head, if that's your heart, you just raise your hand. And a greeter will come and a person, will, they're not going to bother you, they just want to come and help you and lead you to Jesus Christ. Some of you need that element beyond salvation, meaning you need to be walking with Jesus in your life. Some of you need to follow Christ in water baptism. Some of you, you have a big decision you need to make. Many of us need revival tonight. We need to respond to the Word of God. The Word of God has been given tonight. I've told you the secret in Jesus' life. Who will take it? Who will do it? I call you surrender. Surrender tonight, tonight, not not later, tonight. And there may be somebody God's calling to ministry, to missions. You've been fighting it. You've been wondering. It starts with surrender. Surrender. You go to one of our staff members tonight here at Northwest Church and you tell them, God has got it on my heart. I may may need to enter ministry and they'll help you through that. Doesn't mean you're going to, but God's put something in your heart. You can't get rid of it. Listen to me. I'm about done. We need revival. And revival begins with you. Thank you for joining us for this sermon today. If you made the decision to follow Christ, let us know in the comments below or at northwestchurch.tv. If God has encouraged you through this message, be sure to like or share this video with a friend. We'll see you next time.